back to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. This is part two of an episode that we started on Susan and Richard's Bolivian and Peruvian adventure. And it was so interesting that we ended up breaking this into a two-part episode. So today we're crossing the border and going into Bolivia and seeing all the exciting things that they've done there. So I look forward to sharing that with you. And also, if you stay tuned to the end of the program, I promised you some history on the Inca people because it's such a fascinating civilization, but we don't normally cover history. But since we're spending so much time in their territory, I thought you might be interested in some of the background. But I did leave that towards the end. So if you're not into history, you don't have to listen to all that in the beginning part. So anyhow, I found it interesting. I hope you will too. And without further ado, let's get started. So now let's pick up from where we left off on our interview from last time. All right. So from the Reed Islands, then now you're getting to the border with Bolivia. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing that day when you were exploring Cabana and all those kinds of things? Yeah, this is so for most of the trip, you, you know, you have a private guide and a private van to take you around. We were a pretty small group, but just logistically, you cannot take a guided van from one country to another just because of the political rules. So we actually got on a public bus and went through the border checkpoint of Peru, got off the bus there, had to walk across the Bolivian border, and then check in with immigration in Bolivia, and then get back on the same bus. So it was a, a bit of a process, but the actual, the it was a very quick process. It basically is just a stamp stamp when you're through. So it was easy, but it was, was funny that we had to walk across the border. You know, there is one technical piece of travel that you're listeners might want to be aware of, and that is that we had to get our own Bolivian visa and that U.S. citizens have to pay an extra fee for a Bolivian visa. So we had to mail our passports. We had to submit an electronic application and mail our passports to the nearest Bolivian embassy. Yeah, the consulates in Los Angeles. Yeah. And so we mailed it to Los Angeles. So if you're planning a trip there, you do need about three weeks ahead of time to get that process done. And it was about $168. And they add the visa to your passport. And then you just show it to them when you go through. And it was very, very simple. I believe you have to have a visa for Peru too, but they automatically give it, you know, you don't have to send a separate application for it. And there was no extra charge for it. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's important. You don't want to get down there and find out you can't get in the country. No. All right. So now it looks like you took a boat to the Island of the Moon. Right. A motorboat out to a small island called the Island of the Moon. Again, this predated the Inca empire by a fair amount, but the Incas, of course, got there and they you can see evidence of an old temple, which was built pre-Incan, and then there's a rock wall the Incas built next to it. So there's these sort of the two cultures at once there. Again, it's a beautiful view of the Andes from this island. And it was a temple that was supposedly ritual sacrifices there with no written language. There's not a lot that's really known about that, that you can really say positively what happened there. At one time, it was called the Temple of the Virgins. So we're not exactly sure if that was really true. So now you arrive in Copacabana. Tell us about that. Yes, we arrived in Copacabana in the evening, and it was so nice because the other two large cities, Puna and Cusco, were quite noisy. I don't think you necessarily think that they're noisy, but by the time you get to Copacabana, you realize how nice and quiet it is. It's smaller. It's, again, a steep uphill from the waterfront to your hotel. There are lots of tourism. It was a religious site. Apparently, there are huge religious gatherings there once a year where people come from many, many ways. I was thinking it was like the Camino in its own way. Like a pilgrimage of some kind? Yes. So we really delighted in the fact that Coca Cabana was smaller. But in fact, when they have religious pilgrimages there, which happens at least once a year, the town gets swollen with people who traveled from all over Bolivia to attend the church there. And and there was a huge, huge white church. I wouldn't call it a cathedral, but it was a big building. It's like typical Catholic church. Mm, Yes, very much so. So we enjoyed the quietness of the town. There's certainly places you could buy things. The food was good. And then when we visited the church, there were cars for sale outside. And cars were had been blessed and had flowers on them. At first, we thought maybe it was a wedding. We're not quite sure what it was, but there were many cars out in front of the basilica with dressed with flowers and people 
you know, it's a, like a Saturday, Sunday market. We also hike up to what I think were technically 14 crosses, the Catholic crosses. It's not mentioned in our material from Active Adventures, but that was our hike. We hiked up to the highest part of the mountain, and there it was a Sunday, and so there were many Native people also hiking up, although the paths were not at all crowded. We saw one little, kind of a chubby little boy carrying food up because it's when they mix the two religions, their native religion and the Catholic Church, you still want to feed the God who may be there. So he was carrying food up. And once we got up through the 14 stations of the cross, there were more crosses at the top. Each of the crosses had a different blessing. And so one was for health, and you would find people had left pieces of shell or something to, or rocks on the cross itself as an offering to the gods. And then when we got to the top, it was just such a beautiful view, 360 degree view. And interestingly enough, it was a pretty hard hike. And yet at the top, there were all sorts of little booths with people selling candy bars and drinks and crafts. And you might talk about the like the little houses that were crafted. Yeah, I found it interesting. So it's the top is called the Calvarios. It possibly was an Incan ritual site, but it's now more of a Catholic site. In fact, some of the crosses were dated in the 1940s. In addition to the view, though, it's it's very strange to walk up there and see it look somewhat commercialized. There's all these sort of ramshackle booths and things set up for people selling things, not just drinks because you're thirsty, but a lot of people believe that if you leave an offering, represent something you want in your life, that it will come true. So you can buy a little toy on a pickup truck. You can buy a little toy house. That's what you want, a nicer house to have. And you can leave it as an offering and leave some money. And then with the, you know, the right prayer, that will come true for you. So they're making a good deal of money on the side off of, uh, off of the pilgrimage people up there. That's interesting. Anything else about Copacabana in that area before we move on? Just the fact that you know, I think you should tell your viewers that it's not the Copacabana, it's a Copacabana. It's not the... Oh, yes, yes. It's uh, much smaller than the well-known one in, on the coast, but the word just comes from meaning beautiful view of the lake, I guess, something like that. Oh, okay. All right. Good to know. All right. So then now you're flying into the Bolivian capital of La Paz. Can you tell us about that? And you're seeing a train cemetery. What the heck is that? So we actually drove to La Paz a short distance. And then immediately, we actually just end up in El Alto, which is the city where the airport is above La Paz on a plateau. And so shortly after getting there, you don't even see La Paz. You basically take right off and fly to the big salt flats of Uyuni for the evening. And we were driven out. We got there so late because of the flight. We were driven out in the middle of nowhere in the dark and began to wonder if there was really any place to stay out there. And we Sun- thought we were kidnapped. Yeah. <laughs> it makes, makes you wonder for a minute. And we were in these two SUVs and just driving on these dusty roads. And suddenly this big one-story hotel appears and it's built entirely out of salt blocks. And the flooring is all ground salt when you walk in. So it's the whole place is just stark white. And it's, it's quite striking, especially to see it at night. But that was our headquarters for a couple of nights to explore the salt flats. How interesting. Yeah. And I guess I got a, a few things about the salt flats. They're just, there's so many superlatives for it. You might think, what's so special about seeing a big sea of salt? There, You can see those anywhere. But the thing you have to bear in mind is Uyuni is the largest salt flat in the world. It's over 4,000 square miles. And it is so flat. We were told that they can calibrate satellite altitudes by pinging laser beams and things off of the surface. It varies three feet over 4,000 square miles. So that's it's some of the flattest land in the entire world. And you can stand out in the middle of it and you definitely see the curvature of the earth. It's just it's stunning. And did they tell you why it's like that or how come it's dry now? It basically is the floor of an ancient lake, which formed over 40,000 years ago. And it just gradually as climate's changed and things, you know, Changed over the years. The lake finally evaporated, left a huge amount of salt. This is actually a gray seabed from, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. That's what the whole Andes is. So the salt contest is extremely, extremely concentrated in that lake. And now it's primarily dry, but during just after the rainy season, you'll find parts of the salt flat still flooded. And when I say flooded, it's like never more than about an inch of water. But that forms a perfect mirror. And so there's there's places they take you on your salt flat tours where you actually drive out onto this water and you can have great, great pictures of people walking on water and driving on water and the reflection of the sky. It's just like they say it's the biggest mirror in the world. And it really does look like it. I would really encourage people to visit the salt flats if they go to Bolivia. 
it was definitely a unique experience that because of the length of it, there's also bubbling little hot springs from underground streams in part of it, the views of the mountains from that area. We actually had lunch on the salt flats, but they fixed us a very nice lunch. But then a big wind came up and they said, there's usually not wind that time of day. (laughs) But it made it an adventure because we actually had to eat quickly and put the lunch away. There were also flamingos on the edge of the salt flat. And we hiked up a cactus island. Mm -hmm. You might talk about that, Rick. Yeah, the island actually has coral deposits on it. So it gives you, again, that feeling like, wow, this is really is old seafloor. But uh, it's an unusual juxtaposition of coral and cactus. I've never seen anywhere in the world like that. But it's only a few hundred feet high. But when you get up to the top, again, you've got this 360 view of the salt flats in all directions. And we asked about wildlife. And they say there is basically no wildlife on the salt flats at all. But on these islands that's within flying distance of the mainland, we did see birds. Just a couple different varieties, but there were sparrow-like birds out there flitting around trying to, you know, make a living off of uh, what little there is to eat on the island. I've seen photos of the salt flat, so I know what you're talking about. Can you describe the landscape? You talked about the mirror look. What about when it's dry? What does that look like? Or try to describe that landscape to us. I would say we posted one picture on Facebook. And even though I talked about us being in the salt flats, that multiple people said, where did the snow come from? (laughs) So it looks like a big white field of snow. Yeah. And the texture varies. It's not consistent. It just kind of depends on where the moisture was most recently and when did it evaporate last. But it's smooth enough that I just happened to notice in one part of the day's trip, we were driving this SUV across the salt flats to get to the northern end. And we were averaging about 120 kilometers an hour. So that's moving right along. And it was very smooth. You could feel a little texture under the tires, but it wasn't bumpy at all. But if you look close, you can see there's definite texture to the salt. It probably has these quarter inch high bits of roughness to it, but you don't really feel it when you're driving on it. But again, it's flat enough, like I said, three feet over 4,000 square miles that it's just, this is like being on a world's biggest plane. And in some places, it reminds you of rock salt. You know, probably most of us are familiar with rock salt being put on sidewalks in the wintertime. And our hallways in the hotel reminded me of rock salt. You know, they were They weren't concrete. They weren't for carpet. They were actually that salt modules. Very, very coarse crystals, yeah. Our hotel room floors, of course, had carpet put over the salt for our comfort. But a beautiful carpet, by the way. Very Mm -hmm. colorful. Now, some of the pictures I saw, maybe it's where it, either it's been a long time since the rainy season, where it almost looked like circular salt lily pads with a little rim around it. Did you see anything like that at all? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, especially near the where the little artisanal springs come up, you'll get little. We actually saw floating salt crystals too. I took a, I scooped one up and took a picture of it. So you you do get that effect, little round, like say lily pads of salt. And then you talked about snow. I know it didn't snow, but you're actually in a very unusual climate there because you're up high, so it's chilly. Yet you're in a temperate region. So talk a little bit about the weather and why you chose to go in May, and just give us a little overview of what you know about the weather down there. Yeah, we chose May based on the best recommendations we could see for weather. It's You can certainly travel to South America any time of the year, but because so Cusco is 13 degrees south latitude and La Paz is about 16 degrees, so you're really not that far from the equator. So even though it's technically coming into their winter, that you'll get cool daytime and nighttime temperatures, but it happens to be the start of the dry season. So May is a great transitional month. April is still rainy. June is dry, but it's very touristy. You'll get a lot more people there. That's just what you look at the primary people that flock to places like Peru and Bolivia. It's Americans and Europeans for the most part, and that's their prime travel season. So we thought May was that great shoulder time to go where the weather was still good. We had really good luck with weather pretty much the whole time. A couple of rain showers for the whole month we were down in South America. So I think we timed that pretty well. And weather-wise, do you bring like thermal raincoat, you know, the same thing as if you're hiking up a mountain just about anywhere? Do you have to have all the Four Seasons clothes in your day pack? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're prepared for just about anything and surprisingly didn't need that much warm clothing. The worst is it cools off at night. You'll notice that. But especially on the salt flats, places like that, when the sun comes up, it gets, it's, you feel the sun's warmth in a hurry, again, because of your latitude. And yet the only pieces of clothing that I did not use that I had packed was a pair of shorts and a short sleeve shirt. So even though it was warm, it was usually long pants, longer sleeve shirt. Um, 
it could get intense, but I think it was really nice weather for us the whole time. I think, yeah, that reminds me of something that's point about the salt flats is that UV protection. The salt flats, again, it's high, it's 12,000 feet. You're again, 16 degrees latitude. When the sun comes out, like it usually does, on an absolutely pure white surface, I imagine the average person could sunburn in about five minutes. So it's, you need to be fully covered and have a really intense sunblock on the whole time you're out there. And of course, sunglasses. You just don't want to forget that stuff because it you might have a good day, but you'd be very miserable the next day if you don't take precautions. Good advice. Thanks. Was there anything that surprised you about this trip? Ooh, that's a good one. I was thinking of one thing that surprised me both about Peru and Bolivia that I realized I don't yet have a good understanding of. And that is the com- at the community level, there seems to be a form of government. Our guide said, for example, we ate lunch out on a hillside on our way to Puno. And we were looking down on a small village and he said, you know, he would love to own a home in that small village. And, you know, it was quite picturesque and you could understand that. And so we talked to him a little bit about how that would be done. First of all, of course, someone would need to want to sell something, but he said you would have to get the community's approval to do that and to move in. So I wasn't quite sure of the sense of community and what level of governance there is. But I noticed that in both Peru and Bolivia, that you would talk a lot about the community and that the community owned this. And every community might have a pickup, but it would be owned by the community. So it might not be one person's pickup. They might not, you know, the community. We talked about people not having a lot of material wealth in the way you might think of it in the United States but that they were wealthy in their own regard because they always had their own property that was paid for. They may not be paying for electricity or water, but in some communities, of course, they were. There were solar panels that were new, but I didn't understand the governance around this sense of community. But I thought that was something I wanted to come home and learn more about once we were home. Sounds almost like the co-ops they would have in New York. I don't know about other places, but when I was growing up, certain, they would be like condos, but you just couldn't randomly sell your condo. The whole condo building had to approve whoever you sold it to. So it sounds something along those lines. Yeah, it sounds yeah. similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, what Susan said is that our guide had pointed out, to, like, we were up in some remote areas of Peru and just looking at people who lived in shacks and had, you know, a little bit of land. And he said, these people, in my mind, are richer than the people in probably two-thirds of the people in Lima. Because in Lima, it's like any big city somewhere. If you don't have a lot of money, you know, housing's expensive and you're always struggling and uh, there's a high crime rate. You go out in the countryside, there's pretty much no crime. Even though people don't have a lot of material goods, like Sue said, they, they own the land, they have animals, they can feed themselves, they can usually afford a solar panel and get a little bit of electricity, they can make their own clothing, they, they grow potatoes. So in many ways, while their net worth may be low, they're, they're richer than the people on the lower rungs of the big cities. It's really something to think about. I often find in my travels, too, that so many of the communities I go to, and I go to a lot of developing countries, they seem happier than Americans to me. <laughs> And I think there's something to having a more simple where everything you're doing, or just like every room in your house you use every day instead of having massive buildings you don't use. It's just there's something that's eye-opening about traveling and seeing, hey, some people are happier than we are doing with a lot less. Exactly. You know what I've got to ask you about is the train graveyard. Tell us about that. We had a very brief visit to the railway graveyard right outside of the town of Uyuni. It's right on the edge of town. It's just kind of an interesting story in that Bolivia was hoping to, with their mineral extraction and all the salt deposits they had, to build a rail line across what is now part of northern Chile to the coast to have a port for export. In the process of building this rail line, the Pacific broke out and the result of several years of war, basically Chile won the war and they extended their country and it made Bolivia landlocked. They used to actually have their own coastline. So with no way to export, the rail line just kind of sat there and all these imported locomotives from Britain and all the rail lines that were there basically have now just sat in the desert for uh, well since about 1880. And so they're just these enormous piles of rusted hulks of locomotives sitting around at this very eerie. There's just nothing around but the edge of town and salt. You can see the rail line going off in the distance and the heat shimmering on the rails and nothing is stirring. So it's it's a rather interesting experience to see this grand failed experiment. It must have cost them a fortune and to have it just completely fail must have been heartbreaking. 
Yeah, you wonder why they couldn't sell them or something like that rather than just let them rot. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, now my image in my head is very interesting. I haven't seen the pictures of it yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to checking that out. Cool. You mentioned your guides. How about telling us a little bit about them? Our guide was actually from, I want to say Cusco, and he'd gone to school in Lima. I thought he was exceptionally good. He spoke the languages. He related to us very well. He was specially trained in mountain rescue first aid. He was very kind to, and thoughtful to us, but also to every person that he interacted with. He knew so much history, had such a good political understanding of the area that he could have talked all night about it, but in a very valuable way, you know, not just filling our heads with facts, although there weren't lots of facts, but getting us to think about what that meant for life in those areas. Now, when you're in Bolivia, you need to have a Bolivian guide. That's part of the Bolivian requirements. So he had, there was an additional guide that took us out on Lake Titicaca and stayed with us for the days we were there. There was an additional guide when we were in the salt flat, and they were all excellent too. We had a different guide for bicycling who knew his area and knew how to repair bikes, although I'm sure that Bruno was our active adventures guide. I'm sure he could have done any of those things too. But because we are required to have Bolivian guides, we had people who actually lived in the salt flat area or lived in the islands. So they were very skilled and very knowledgeable. I have found that traveling with active adventures, I think Rick and I both now have done, I've done four trips with them, and I think Rick has done three, that they always get excellent guides. The food is always really good and healthy, and you just have a quality trip. One of the things, we had a traveling companion with us in Bolivia, and she had read an article about how unsafe the Bolivian highways were and how you had more vehicle accidents there than in any other country in the world. Anyway, at least a country who reported their statistics. And because you're traveling with active adventures, they've qualified the vans, they've qualified the drivers, and so we felt safe. Yeah, I love my trip with them in New Zealand. Where else did, have you been with them? I did North and South Islands of New Zealand. And then we did the, what do they call our other trip? Jaguar. Jaguar, the Jaguar trip just before this chinchilla trip. And I did South Island, the Rimu trip too with New Zealand, with active and then of course Jaguar as well. I want to do your trip now too. Like I said, the New Zealand was just blew me out of the water. I love that trip. Probably, not probably, that was the best trip, particularly some of the things we did in the North Island just blew me out of the water. It was great. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. What are your favorite stories that you tell about this trip? You know, because we are active people who hike, bike, and kayak, our friends want to know about those parts of the adventure and how they folded into what we were doing. And we were able to do it, be active every day without needing to, it, it just folded in nicely and smoothly, which is probably the experience you also had with active adventures in New Zealand. So highlights were the Euros Islands, the Reed Islands and the people there. The salt flats, again, we, you had to fly because of the distance to get there, but critically one of the most recommended things to do. We didn't talk about everything we did there, but we also visited a small museum that a man had put together himself. He didn't charge for people to come, but he just gathered historical artifacts. He also had a little cave with two mummies in it, a lot of artwork. So I would say the Eurus Island and the Salt Flats, but I also love La Paz. I would have loved to have spent more time hiking outside and around La Paz, but the cable carves views of La Paz is unique in my experience. I've had other people now tell me that the other big cities they've been to where, you know, the roads are small, they can't, they have to tear down historical buildings to put in roads and people don't have cars anyway. So these cable cars crisscross La Paz, we took the cable car to the highest point of La Paz, but you could have, we'd have had more days, we could have traveled all through La Paz by the cable cars. So that was also very interesting. Yeah. And that's where your trip ends is in La Paz, right? So somebody could easily do that. Yes. Sure. The, you get a full day tour of La Paz. We got to see the outside of the San Pedro prison, which is a whole story in itself. One of the most incredibly off the wall prisons in the world. Uh, now, you, now we can't end without telling us why. You got to tell us that. <laughs> So uh, there's actually been an amazing book written about the San Pedro prison called Marching Powder. Basically, 
It's a prison for relatively low risk people. A lot of them were drug czars, but these are not like, you know, super risky people. But it's basically an entire city in itself. You buy your way in. Now, things have changed a bit over the years, and they've tried to tone this down a little bit. But when at the time in the 90s, early 2000s, when this book was written, uh, bribery was big down there. And so uh, you bribe your way in, and, and where you stay, Depends on how much money you have. If you want a super safe place with good neighbors, uh, you could buy into the five star rated section. And if you're kind of the one star rated section, well, you're crammed in five people to a cell and you don't get a whole lot. But anything you want inside the walls, restaurants, groceries, anything you name, you can get. It's just it's a small town all by itself. So you get to walk around the outside and look at San Pedro. You could take the cable cars around La Paz. You get to go to the Valley of the Moon, which has incredible structures that are eroded like the pinnacles and fins and that's that's pretty cool so and, and a bit of the you get a bit of the cultural history you can see the main squares but there's they, they haven't had multiple revolutions in bolivia so there's the main square still has bullet holes in it which they think it's a good thing to leave up as a reminder of, of their their recent past and the, the little cobbled streets with the little witch doctor shops that you could get to wander by and look at the kind of things they can sell there that come from all over the country and deep in the amazon Things are imported there, whatever kind of rituals you want to perform. <laughs> so it's quite interesting. That does sound cool. Yeah, I forgot about the markets. You had the little witch doctor stalls. Anything strike your fancy when you saw that? The witch doctor stall, I guess I didn't know what to expect. I think I expected a guy in a grass skirt and long hair or something and shrunken heads. It wasn't quite that way. It's just, but these people do sell quite a few things from, again, from the Amazon, other places that are, that are crafted to have special religious significance to people who, who really believe in uh, shamanism, want to sort of do things and cure things the old way. So you can buy all kinds of herbs and potions and it just doesn't look quite as exotic as I expected, but it's still quite interesting to see the kind of things and a lot of it's symbolic too again you want to buy a symbol of something that you want to have good luck brought to you you can you can get it at wish doctor stall <laughs> yeah a little bit of everything interesting and you can tell just by looking at it, that's a witch doctor stall well we were guided to one i don't know if i it doesn't really say that at the cross <laughs> across the, uh, the awning of the shop but you can sort of look at the the paraphernalia inside and get an idea that this is not your usual kmart <laughs> Oh, so these are stores. I thought you're out in an outdoor market. This you're going into a store. Well, they're storefronts. Yeah, each each storefronts probably it's a little shop that they're typically maybe ten feet wide. They're long and narrow, and so a lot a whole bunch of people have these all side by side on this. There's a street in La Paz that's really well known for this. They kind of all congregate in the same area. And I don't know if they would ever have a door that could close. These are open air stalls. So they are stores, not, it's not like an open market where everything's just out on tables. But I didn't, I can't think of a door that would close. I don't know if they would pull down cloth. They could have hit a roll top, the solid walls anyhow. It's more like things you would find in third world countries. Gotcha. Now, overall, I know you were active every day. On a scale of one to five, when five is the most difficult, what would you place it as as far as difficulty level? I don't think the Bolivian trip wasn't as as strenuous as our trip in Peru. For me, I'd call it a three. I was actually thinking of this earlier. In a way, I would call it a two. Maybe so, um, yeah. But I think part of that is caution because you're at elevation. You're almost always at 12,000 feet. And even young people, of course, <laughs> are sometimes challenged from 8,000 feet up. So I think that you're a little bit less active because of the risk of elevation and not knowing how people will do. But we were active enough to feel like we had a challenge almost every day. And that was important to us. And you guys are very well traveled. How did this adventure compare to some of the other adventures you've had in your life? I would consider it to be in the top five. I find it very difficult to compare trips because we are often doing something so totally different. I've been to Antarctica. I would certainly clear put my New Zealand trip with active adventures in my top five. Flora and fauna there are so unique. And here, this was a totally different country than I've ever visited before. Our guides reminded us that South American countries tend to be more alike than, than not. I don't know if that's totally true, but Bolivia and Peru were somewhat similar. But it was beautiful. It was unique. The food was wonderful. The people were warm and welcoming, and we got to be active every day. And of course, for me, Lake Titicaca 
and kayaking on it was a bucket list item. So I would rank it very high. And how about you, Richard? Susan and I have done a lot of different travels from, you know, apart from each other until we hooked up. So I have a little different background. But so to me, culturally, this was one of the most interesting trips I've done. I've been to the Dolomites in Italy. I've been to Patagonia. I've been to the Alps, you know, in New Zealand. And so I've seen some just spectacular mountain scenery. And while the Andes were great, the mountain experience here wasn't quite the same. But to me, I didn't go for that. I went for the, basically, it's, it's just the wonder of the Incan Empire and what it was really like to see it in person. And then, of course, who, does, who wouldn't want to see Lake Titicaca and Salt Flats? I mean, it's just two unique areas in the world just made this all come together for me. So, yeah, again, definitely a top five trip of ones I've done around the world. What's on the bucket list still, or do you have anything planned? Actually, we do. We've got a, we're booked for a trip in September to Japan, to the Japanese Alps on Hokkaido. And it's run by a different company. It's the one I've used before. They're actually based out of Portland, and they only offer this trip once every two or three years. And I just thought, I mean, to me, just to go to Japan and see nothing but cultural things would be probably not a bucket list trip for me. But to combine that with seeing the Japanese Alps, which look as nice as any Alpine place I've ever seen for hiking, I thought, wow, yeah, let's let's try this. And we were a little, <laughs> it's kind of would have liked to put it off until next year. But again, this is one of the few years they're offering it. And we just got back from our trip which had 10 flights between the Jaguar Chinchilla trips. There's 10 separate air flights and they wanted us to book our flights. And we just like, we almost couldn't face doing it. I thought, no, <laughs> after a couple of days of rest, we decided to go for it. So uh, we're booked now for Japan in September. Oh, how fun. When you get back, definitely give me a holler. I'd love to have you on the show and talk about it. Well, thank you, Susan and Richard, for coming on the show. It's been great. You've given us so much information and it's now add another trip to the list of someplace I got to go. Okay, sounds good. Look forward to having you guys back. (laughs) (laughs) We'd love it. Now, I know it sounds like we finished with the show, but for those of you interested, I've got just a couple minutes more about the Inca Empire itself. It is a fascinating, fascinating civilization. So stay tuned for that. Here we go. The Inca Empire itself covered parts of what is now Peru, Chile, Argentina, Ecuador, and Bolivia. And the Inca civilization is the largest pre-Columbian empire. It is one of only five civilizations that's considered pristine, meaning it did not have any outside influence to create the civilization. They created all by themselves. So it's an indigenous group with no outside influence to form a new civilization. So think of that. Only five civilizations in the history of mankind. That in and of itself is pretty cool. And like Genghis Khan, awful though he may be, he was a brilliant manager, a brilliant leader, because he not only conquered people to take over the territory, he assimilated and learned from them. And that's what the Incas did as well. And that probably, and this is just my speculation, was one of the reasons of their success. They believed in the sun god, Inti. The Inca king was considered the son of the sun. Like I mentioned in the interview, they were able to do these incredible archaeological wonders without the benefit of any wheeled vehicles. They didn't have any draft animals. All they have is some llamas and some alpacas, which can't carry a whole lot. Yet they still did this incredible stonework, massive stonework. Imagine it was done by the slave labor. We're going to get to labor in a little bit too. And they didn't have any knowledge of iron or steel, no method of writing to pass on knowledge. Knowledge was passed on, they believe, through the weavings, some little knotted strings They called Kipo, Q-U-I-P-O, that would help them keep records, perhaps by a way of counting knots or something like that. So that's how they were able to communicate. So I guess the knotted string is a bit of a writing system, even though it doesn't use letters. They had no monetary system. They were pretty much just barter. And then there's also like a, a collective belief that you gave to the system, almost like a socialistic system, where everybody had to, to give labor to the Inca rulers But in exchange for this labor, it was reciprocated back by granting the people access to land and providing food and drink whenever they're doing celebratory feasts. So the subjects had, there was a give and take, just like there was a reciprocal relationship between the people. If I need some of this, I trade you this, a regular barter system. They were also a bit socialistic in that they had a vertical system of assessing and distributing whatever the resources were, a bit of Whoever needs gets more, whoever has gives more kind of a thing. But for them, it did work. 
And without any of the tools that we've talked about, they still were able to create one of the world's most impressive civilizations. They did this fantastic terrace work. And by carving out these terraces on the mountainsides, they were able to create an abundance of food in this climate that gets rather cold at night. So they were able to compensate by doing it in this terrace system. Things were going pretty well. And so the Inca Empire started in the early 13th century until they're conquered by the Spaniard conquistadors in 1572. And how all that came about is a guy by the name of Francisco Pizarroa. He and his brothers had traveled south from Panama and they saw the wealth and the abundance and the resources of the Inca people. So they went back to Spain and asked the queen for permission to come conquer and, and Francisco wanted to be its viceroy. So in 1532, they returned with just 168 men, a single cannon, 27 horses, which the Incas had never seen before. And the soldiers had lances, they had long swords, and they had steel armor plates. The Inca people, on the other hand, even though they were overwhelmingly large numbers, had never seen a horse, had no concept of how to fight cavalry. All they had was stone and wood. They had a little bit of copper and bronze at this point, but they had such significant technical disadvantages and then none of their weapons could pierce the armor that it was a pretty quick fight and it didn't take long for the Spanish people to conquer. And then of course they brought disease and particularly it started with smallpox and because of the Incas very extensive and well-managed street and road systems, the smallpox traveled quickly and eradicated a lot of the native peoples. A couple other interesting things too about just the thought processes of the Inca people. At the time the infant mortality rate was really high So parents really didn't consider their kids almost as part of the family. They didn't really start worrying about them because so many of them died until they were about two or three years old. And like, okay, this one's going to make it. So then they would have a big ceremony, the Rudachico ritual. So the children were celebrated and welcomed basically to the family at this current stage of ignorance because they don't know anything yet about the world. So all the relatives would come to celebrate their entrance from being in the state of inexperience start their journey to learn about reason and learn how to become part of the family and their role in society. And so they're in this section until they hit puberty. But in the meantime, they're allowed to have before puberty, their folly stage, which both sexes would be able to have outside relationships without having to worry about getting pregnant. I thought that was kind of interesting. But once they hit puberty, next comes the big celebration again. So this is their second main celebration. And This is the time that they're now becoming adults. But still at this point, they don't even get ripe for serious labor until it's around the time of their marriage, which for most of them was around age 20, a few years younger than that for the women, as is typical in many societies. While the males and females had traditional roles, the men did a lot of the labor and the women did the cooking and took care of the kids and all that kind of stuff, they were still considered equal partners. And it took both partners to make a whole unit. And unlike a lot of societies, the females could inherit, and not only could, they did. The inheritances was passed down female to female and the male to male, so parallel lines of descendants. As far as their religion goes, they believed in reincarnation, and upon death, you would follow a long road with the assistance of a black dog. I thought that was rather interesting. Heaven, although they didn't call it that, would be a field covered with flowers and in the distant snow-capped mountains. That does sound like heaven to me. And if you're a good Inca, you followed their moral code. Basically three rules. Do not steal, do not lie, and do not be lazy. That sounds simple enough. And if you're a good Incan, the sun's warmth you would enjoy in your future life versus being in the cold ground. The Inca nobility wanted to separate themselves from the regular people. So they practiced something called a cranial deformation. Whenever there was a newborn of a noble, They would wrap tight cloth straps around the head and make the skull conical, kind of like the cone heads of the old Saturday Night Live. And in this way, you could see at a glance that somebody was of noble descent. And as I'm sure you're aware, the Incas did practice human sacrifice, including child sacrifice. And this was happened more around important events or whenever there's a famine. Like I said, they did not have a written language. So a lot of things have been backed into and thought, you know, they've kind of done workarounds to figure out some of the things that we learn about, about the Incas. But it's truly an incredible civilization that whenever I make my way down there in South America, I can't wait to explore and see firsthand. 
While there were some earlier civilizations in the Andes, the indigenous people, because they were so isolated, had to come up with some really creative ways to solve their problems. One of which we already mentioned, the quipos, which were the string knots. And in that way, they were able to communicate via the number of knots, the style of knots, the colors of the knots, different information. So it was a language of sort. They didn't have the wheel, so they only traveled by foot. Since they didn't have the pack animals to carry heavy loads, to move the rocks, for example, all they have is like the, the llamas, which could carry at most 45 kilograms or about 100 pounds. They just weren't big enough or strong enough to be used for plowing or for riding. They didn't have very good soil. It was thin. The climate's cold. They had only seasonal precipitation and no flat land. So they came up with the terraces. So because of their challenging environment, they used their brains and came up with this really sophisticated agricultural technology. They learned to domesticate large seeded plants, such as wheat and barley. And it wasn't long before they were able to finally got them, domesticate the horses and the cattle. In the desert areas, they developed irrigation. And by terracing and exploiting microclimates and selective breeding, they were able to conquer some of the climatic problems that they had. In order to maximize their possibilities of success, they experimented with planting several crops at several different elevations and exposures to have the best chance of success. All in all, it's an impressive accomplishment for peoples that did not have the basic accoutrements that we have for civilization. And I cannot wait to explore it in person. I hope you've enjoyed this. It ended up being, it was planned to be in a one-part series, but we were having such a good time and learning so much about it that this turned into a two-part series. I sure thought it was really fun. Of course, we'll have a travel planner for this episode that you will get automatically with the monthly newsletter, which I hope you signed up for. You can sign up at kit at activetraveladventure.com just by sending me an email or by going to the website activetraveladventures.com and click on the newsletter button there. Susan and Richard sent lots of photos. So I'd like to share those with you too on the website. Their webpage will be activetraveladventures.com slash Bolivia, B-O-L-I-V-I-A. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast. It lets the powers that be in the podcast world know that people are interested in it and helps others find the program. And I also encourage you to sign up and subscribe to the companion podcast that comes out on alternate Thursdays, the Adventure Travel Show podcast, which teaches you the how-tos of adventure travel. I really appreciate you listening. I hope you're enjoying the program. Until next time, this is Kit Parks. Adventure on. Adventure on.